Welcome to Standing on the Word, a ministry of the South Seminole Baptist Church located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in Eastridge, Tennessee. We are a fellowship of believers dedicated to ministering to the Eastridge, North Georgia area. Here you will find an exciting children's worship and an active Awana program. Students will be challenged in Christian growth and provided times of wholesome fellowship. God's Word is taught to those of all ages. Worship services are times of praise and celebration. We invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Now we ask you to stay with us as our pastor shares from God's Word. Allow the Lord to speak to your heart as the choir and congregation lead us in singing praises to our Seminole, We are recognizing uh, some of our students that have reached a great level of accomplishment and we're proud of them and we're celebrating with them. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna ask uh, Chris if you would uh, to come at this time in case you don't know Chris, he is our student pastor and uh, he's gonna help us to recognize these graduating seniors. Chris? All right, well guys, we've got uh, three graduates that we're gonna recognize today. It's always exciting to watch, watch different kids, whether we get to see them the entire time that we watch their entire childhood grow up, or maybe we see every once in a while we'll have kids that'll pop in right before graduation or something like that, they come in. I came to South Seminole even as a senior, so sometimes that happens. You get a friend that reaches you, and that's what happens. So anyway, I uh, want to recognize first, our first one is going to be Miss Kayla King Kaufman. So Kayla, come on up. Everybody give her a hand. She has, she is a, uh, have you graduated yet? Have you graduated yet? Has a graduation happened yet? When it, it's Friday. Okay, I was going to say, I had, I had not heard. All right, so you're graduating from Lakeview, Fort Oglethorpe High School, right? Okay, so what's, what is, what's your next thing? What's your next plan? Uh, Chattanooga State. You know what you're going to be doing yet? No. Not yet? It's probably a good idea. J just so you know, if nobody tells you this, the majority of the people, whatever you major in, they never study that. They never do that. So that's, that's life. Raise your hand if that's the case. Most of them didn't go to college. It's okay. They're like me. So, all right. Listen, we've got a Bible for you right here. This right here. Now, listen. I know it kind of seems like, oh, well, we're graduating. We're supposed to get a gift or something like that and all that. But let me tell you something about this. Okay? I didn't figure this out until later on in life. This book right here, as many answers as what your classes are going to have and as many answers as your friends and your family are going to have, all those other things, they're going to change. All those other things are going to be dependent on what's going on in life. This book never changes. This book's consistent, and the cool thing about it is it's right. Okay? Use it if you've never, like you've never used it before. Okay, girl? All right, love you. Proud of you. Thank you. Good job. All right. Now we're going to recognize Miss Holly Helms. Come on up, Holly. I give her a hand. Hello, Miss Holly. Now, if you did not know, Holly can tear up playing a guitar. So she is, she is awesome. One of these days, we're going to get her up here on stage, and she's going to teach people how it's done. I can play a guitar if it's on CD, okay, just so you know. Anyway, Holly's, Holly uh, Suzanne Helms gradu is graduating from Lakeview Fort Oglethorpe High School. Do you know what's next? Yes, I'm going to Chat State for Master in Cosmetology. Master in Cosmetology. So you can give me a haircut, right? Okay, good, good. I'd look good with a mohawk. That's what she's thinking. So, well, listen, just like I told her, I want you to think about this book. It's not just a gift. It's something to use in your life, okay? Now, you, you guys have all grown up around church. You've grown up around the Lord. You've been introduced to him right and left. You've made decisions in your life. But decisions that you make when you just say them with your mouth, they're not real. Decisions that are made in your heart, you can see on the outside, Okay? Apply this book. Let it be something that's important to you. Love you, girl. Congratulations. 
And our next graduate that we're going to be recognized is Mr. Joe Brumlow. Let's see, I don't think Joe was able to make it in this morning, but we do want to recognize him. Joe's been a faithful part of our student ministry for a, quite a while now and uh, very rarely misses. And of course, the one day he would miss would be uh, on graduate day, but that's how it goes. But anyway, make sure that you, when you see Joe, congratulate him. Let him know that you're proud of him. He has uh, been a very faithful part of our ministry, and we're very proud to have him. Glad to, glad to know him. I know he is planning on going to college. His, uh, his plans, last I heard, were going to Dalton State and ultimately he'd like to work in forensics and so that's um, that's his ultimate goal so please make sure that you let him know that you're proud of him and that you're praying for him and let's give our give our students a hand it takes our shame away it heals our deepest pain it has the power to remove our guilty stain. It mends our broken hearts, renewing all our thoughts. It bought our freedom so we would not have to pay the blood, the blood. darkness flee protects us when we're weak no force can stand against the blood that covers me you gave us everything that day on Calvary we become victorious the day that we receive the blood That washes white as snow. Death lost its sting when we were cleansed from all our sins. And now the spotless Lamb, who sits at God's right hand, lives to intercede and make us holy just like Him.
Before I started being an interim pastor, I was the senior pastor in four different churches over a span of 30 years. In fact, I pastored in four different states, and so I had to, I had to cross state lines in order to keep pastoring, apparently, uh, as time went along. Uh, but uh, in those 30 years, of course, I preached a lot of messages and heard a lot of choir specials, and I did a lot of weddings, and I could tell you some stories about weddings that uh, you would not believe a little bit of, you know, insider information. And I uh, did a lot of baby dedications. But I also did a lot of funerals. In fact, when I was senior pastor at First Baptist Church of Tampa, Florida, in one year, I did 50 funerals. In that particular year, there was one day that I did three funerals back to back to back, one at 10, one at 2, and one at 6. So it's hard to remember all of those sermons and all of those choir specials. It's even hard to remember all of those baby dedications and all of those children's messages and all the weddings and all the funerals. But there's one funeral that I will never, never forget. I'll never forget the, the casket was right in front of the stage. And at the end of the service, the family wanted to pass by and see husband, father, grandfather one more time. And when the widow approached the casket, I could see on her face that she was doubly distraught, more than I had seen her in any other time. And she was so overwhelmed with her mourning and her grief that she actually laid over the casket, held on to her husband, called his name, and said, please, please, please come back to life. Please come back to life. Please don't leave me. Please come back to life. And of course, those in attendance were just in silent shock that she was so overwhelmed. Of course, she did not have the power to bring him back to life. Nor did I, nor did anyone else in the room. In fact, no human has that authority and that kind of power. But I know someone who does. Our God has the power to restore life, to bring that which is dead to new life and to bring life into what seems to be an impossible situation. If you doubt that, turn with me in your Bibles, or if you don't have a copy of God's Word, we're going to show it here on the screen. Uh, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel, chapter 37. Uh, this is the story, uh, perhaps you're familiar with it, of the, the, the prophet Ezekiel. He, he was trying his best to help the people of God to understand how far away from God they were. And because they had wandered far away from God, they were not fulfilling God's destiny for them. And really, they had grown cold towards God. And in a sense, the people of God were, were lifeless. In a way, their, their enthusiasm and their joy had literally died. And their passion to know God and to follow Him was no longer there. 
And so, God brought Ezekiel out into the desert to show him something, to show him what he could do. And if he could do what Ezekiel was about to see, then he could restore and revive and bring life back into his own people. And so we begin with verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 37. And the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Now, nothing gives us a clear picture of death anymore than an open valley, an open desert, an open field where there's nothing but bones picked clean by the birds, made white by the scorching sun, no life whatsoever to be seen or heard. And so uh, this valley is full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. Symbolic of, of what had happened to God's people. How that they had wandered far from him. They were not fulfilling their destiny. Uh, they had lost their, their passion to do what God had called them to do. And because of that, their lives, their, their attitudes, their, their existence had become very dry and distant. Verse 3, and so he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, when God asks a question, he already knows the answer. And so why does he ask questions? when he already knows the answer, because he, he wants us to see something. And so he wanted Ezekiel to, uh, to see uh, what he was trying to show him. And so I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. It's almost as if Ezekiel was saying, oh, Come on, Lord, you know the answer to that question. You know that you can bring life, breathe revitalization and renewal into anything, no matter how dry or dead it might be. So he said to me, verse 4, then prophesy to these bones. I mean, if that's what you really believe, you know that I can bring life to where there is death. Then prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will put sinews in you and bring flesh upon you. And I will cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and then you will know that I am the Lord. If you believe, if, if you know that I know, then prophesy and speak that word. And that's exactly what Ezekiel did. And when he spoke that prophecy, those sun-scorched, dry bones began to vibrate. And they began to shake. And they began to rattle and roll. And they began to fly towards each other. And they started connecting again. And, 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 and then oh, what was just old dry bones started uh, being uh, connected with, with sinew and tendons and, and, and all that connects a skeleton. And, and it wasn't long until uh, skin started wrapping around those bones and God breathed life into what had been nothing but death. 
Do you believe God can do that? Do you believe God can do that in God's people, breathe new life into the people of God? Because you see, today, in, in far too many churches, we have forgotten what God has called us to do. And we have forgotten what our destiny is as the people of God. And because of that, uh, all too often, uh, our, our passion uh, to know God and to serve Him wanes. Our, our passion to worship Him isn't as vibrant as it used to be. And uh, worship and service and Bible study and ministry and all of that becomes dry and lifeless and almost meaningless. And so we find today that there are a number of churches that are dying or dead. And I just want you to be reminded of what Ezekiel experienced that day. That God took that which was dry and lifeless and he pulled it all together and he renewed it and revitalized it and brought new life. He, he literally caused what had died to live again. God can do that. And I want you to see what else he did. Uh, skip down to verse 15. It says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, Ezekiel, Take a stick for yourself and write on it. Write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. And then take another stick and write on it. And this one is for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions. And then join them together for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. You see, not only had the people of God become dry and dead, uh, they were divided. You see, over the years, what uh, once had been 12 tribes, but, but really one people of God, uh, they had had disagreements and they had had splits, and, 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 and now they were divided into two kingdoms. And, and what God is showing Ezekiel and God's people and hopefully us is that not only can God take that which is dead and bring life to it, but he can take that which is divided and bring unity. And once again, so many of our churches today are in one sense or another divided. Sometimes they're divided along generational lines. Sometimes they're divided along worship preference lines. Sometimes they're divided uh, over cultural lines or, 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 or even uh, uh, over ethnic lines. There's all kinds of things that, that can make what should be unified and one body somewhat scattered and broken and divided. And so once again, God proves that he's the one. Remember the, the, the poor widow over the casket saying, please come back to life, but nobody in the room had the power to answer her plea. But we do know that God can take that which is dead and bring life to it once again and that which was divided and bring unity to it again. Where there is life, there is growth. In, in, in just a little while, we're going to dedicate a little, little Gracie. We expect new life to grow, to develop, to mature, to change. We want 
our young people to grow into maturity. We want our businesses to grow. We, we want our school children to grow in knowledge and in intellect. We, we want things to grow. And healthy things naturally have a tendency to grow. So when we're talking about life and God bringing life to that which is dry and dead, uh, when we're talking about God bringing that which is divided into new unity, when we're talking about God breathing life into a church, we're not looking for numerical growth. Because cancers reproduce rapidly, but they're not healthy. In fact, cancers will ultimately kill you. So it's not just, you know, a multiplication of cells. No, what we're looking for as evidence of real God-given, God-breathed life is good health. And so, I'm starting a new message series today called Essentials. Essentials of what? Essentials of good church health. And so, since we know that God can revitalize us and renew us, and bring new life into God's people. And, and I'm convinced, South Seminole Church, that, that you want to fulfill God's destiny and you want to reach your full potential as a church, then what I want to challenge you with over the next few weeks is let's make sure that we understand the essentials of a healthy church. And then let's look in the mirror and see where we're healthy and perhaps where we're not, where we're balanced in the essentials of good church health and, and where we're out of balance. And let's seek to be balanced in all of these essentials so that we can, by the word of the Lord, show who he is to the nations and to the neighborhoods, and to our neighbors, because we're vibrant and growing in good health as God's people. So let me share with you just quickly five essentials of a healthy church. Now, in the weeks to come, I'm going to take each one of these essentials and I'm going to break them down one by one. But uh, this morning, I just want you to see the big picture. And so, the five essentials of a healthy church. One, fellowship. You see, churches grow warmer through fellowship. Now, a lot of people have the idea that fellowship is getting together after church on Sunday night and having punch and cookies. Well, that can create an atmosphere for fellowship, but fellowship is much more than that. Fellowship is about relationships. Fellowship is about that people long to belong. Fellowship is about knowing and being known. It's about doing life together. It's about getting to know each other so well, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, the celebrations, the painful moments, to the point that you're actually comfortable in each other's kitchen. you got to be really comfortable to be invited into the kitchen, right? And so fellowship is when the people of God do life together and they pull for each other and they challenge each other and they spend time together, and they do stuff together, and they're building relationships so that they know each other, and they belong to each other, and they let people know you're not just welcome, you're wanted. We want you to be a part of our fellowship. It's about a church being family. 
It's about praying for each other. It's about being there in times of need. It's about doing life together. And it's not just about us, but it's about those that we don't have relationship with yet. It's about building relationships with people so that they begin to trust you. They begin to know you. They begin to feel like that you want them in your life. And so even people just out in the community, fellowship is taking the time to intentionally build relationship bridges so that perhaps one day they trust you enough that they'll actually listen to what you have to say from your heart about your love for God and how they can have a relationship with Him too. So you can see how good, healthy, vibrant fellowship amongst God's people is essential to being a healthy church. Another essential is discipleship because churches grow deeper through discipleship. Now, I know that Peter, James, and John were disciples. And so, you know, maybe discipleship is wearing a long robe and sandals. I, you know, perhaps, but maybe not. Because discipleship is much more than just being called a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, a, a disciple is, is one who sits at the feet of the master and seeks to learn and seeks to understand and, and literally spends time with the teacher just like the disciples did. Look, Jesus didn't take the 12 and sit them over here exclusively and say, you sit still while I instill doctrine and truth. Now, there were times that he set them down and he answered their questions and, and he taught them through stories and parables and truths. But also, they, they just spent time with him and, and sought to understand who he was and, and, and how they could become like him. That's what discipleship is. It's, it's growing in your faith and in your knowledge of God and His Word to the point that you, you really understand who He is and, and what He wants you to do, and, and you become, just, just through the process of, of spiritual growth, more like Him. And so a true disciple is somebody who, who's becoming more like Jesus every day. In other words, you're more like Jesus now than you were last year, and you fully anticipate because you are intentionally seeking to, to know more and to follow Him better and to serve Him more effectively, you anticipate you'll be more like Him this time next year. That is, that is discipleship. So it's, it's, not, it's not sitting people down and saying, now these are the things you need to know, even though that at times can be part of it, but it's helping new believers or young believers or weak believers understand what it really means to be a faithful, committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. And so there are a lot of churches that are looking for a big crowd. So they're a mile wide, but an inch deep because it's important to go deeper with God through discipleship. And then third, churches grow stronger through worship. Now, just because we show up at the worship service doesn't mean that we have worshiped. In fact, a, a lot of people have this idea of worship. They kind of have the idea that that all of us up here on stage, that it's kind of like a theater, and we're like, we're like actors. And, you know, those in the audience, you know, you, you're the audience, and so you're just sort of watching, you know, what's going on up here and then responding to it, you know. And so if something funny is said, you laugh, and if if Tony says sing, you sing, and you know, but, but, but these are the actors, 
And, and the Holy Spirit is off to the side, you know, kind of like at a, at a play, prompting the actors as to what they should say and do next. Now, that is not worship. Let me tell you what worship is. Worship is when God is the audience. When God is the audience, an audience of one. And you, in this analogy, are the actors. You're the participants. You're the ones that God is watching. Now, now we have a role, too, because we're, we're, we're prompting you. But, but we're, we're not here as a spectator sport. This is to be full-out participation. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's a focus on the audience. What, what an actor is trying to do is to emote feelings and the story and, and, and whatever it is that the actor is trying to communicate, trying to get the audience to feel that too. And so through our singing and through our preaching and through our giving and through our testimonies and through the reading of God's word and all of that, collectively, we are before the Lord wanting to express to him how much we love him and how much we appreciate him and how much we value him. And, and so you can see how that true, genuine worship is essential when it comes to being a healthy church. You know, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful when we walk out after a service th that instead of talking about how we sang a song, we talked more about the wonderful words of grace that we just sang and how much it honored the Lord and how much it spoke of how awesome He is. You know, talking about being divided along generational lines. Those that love the more traditional hymns love them because they tell a story. They speak of who God is. They speak of His greatness and His majesty and His love. And they, they speak of salvation. They speak of the salvation story. They speak of heaven. They speak of what's to come. They, they tell a story. They speak of God. Oh, one sort of unique thing, and I, I realize I'm speaking a little bit in generalities, but, but one unique thing about, about more contemporary music is that it, it's not always about God. More than likely, it is an offering of prayer and praise to God. So it's not talking about God. It's talking to God. And so... Those of you that have no appreciation for traditional hymns, hey, we're bragging on who God is, and He is worthy of our praise. And those of you that have less than appreciation for contemporary music, when, when one of those songs comes up, r remember, you're not the audience, He is. And you have an opportunity to express, perhaps, in that song, a praise or a prayer directly to God himself. You can see how that worship is an essential part of being a healthy church. Number four, churches grow broader through ministry. Now, ministry is meeting people's needs at their point of need. And so we, we minister to the sick. We minister to the poor. We minister to those that are emotionally distraught. We minister to broken families. We minister to people at their points of need. And since people are messy, so is ministry. So if, if you as a church have a heart to get elbow deep in the lives of people, and especially people who God has placed in our neighborhoods but have yet to come to our church... Just understand, 
It's not easy. It's hard work and it can be messy. And it's not always appreciated or understood. And sometimes our motives are questioned. But let me tell you something. We might be the only Jesus some people ever see. As the church, we become his hands and his feet, his mouth, his eyes, his ears. We began to show people his beating heart, how much that he loves. Our ministry of giving a cold cup of water to somebody in need might be the only expression of God's love that they've experienced for days or months or years. Besides that, it's often through ministry that we actually win the right to tell our story and to tell his story. People are not interested in, in, you know, knowing what we know unless they know that we care about them. And so it opens up their lives and their hearts if we begin to get involved in their lives through touches of ministry. So you can see how that ministry would be an essential part of a healthy church. And, and finally, churches grow larger through evangelism. Now, I think everybody knows that, uh, that we as a church have, have, have been commanded by the Lord to go and tell. To, to go and tell how much God loves them, to go and tell uh, how that Jesus died for them, to go and tell how that they can have a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, to go and tell, to share the gospel, to share the good news that our sins can be forgiven and we can be welcomed one day into God's heaven, to share the story, the story of the Bible, the blood-bought story of God. And so, I'm sure you can see that in order for the church to grow larger, even though that's not the only goal, because we want to grow warmer and deeper and stronger and broader, but in order to grow larger, to reach people, we've got to share the good news, both in big ways, like, you know, outreach events, and one-on-one -on -one personally as we share with friends, neighbors, relatives, or sometimes even strangers, how much God loves them and how they can have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. You say, Pastor Randall, where did you get these five things? Right out of the Bible. Right from God's Word. Remember, the Lord told Ezekiel, prophesy by the word of the Lord. And so if it's the word of the Lord, then we ought to do it, right? Well, you, you, I'm sure remember that during Jesus' earthly ministry, he gave us what has become known as the great commandment. So quickly take your copy of God's word and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. The disciples have just asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? I mean, what's the most important commandment of all? What, what's the number one thing we're supposed to do in order to please God? And Jesus says to them in verse 37, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now that is worship. And then he goes on to say, this is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that is ministry. Because you're going to take care of yourself best you can. And if you love your neighbor like you love yourself, then you're going to meet your neighbor at their point of need 
just like you're going to meet yourself at your point of need. Whatever it is you need, you're going to try to figure out a way to get it, right? Well, when we know our neighbor's needs, through ministry, we try to figure out how to meet it. And then, not only did Jesus give us the great commandment, but he also gave us the great commission. And so, turn just a few pages to the right, to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, these are some of the last words that Jesus gave us, words of instruction. Verse 18, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke to his disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, I'm speaking the word of the Lord here. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, of all dialects, of every people group, every corner of of society, every cultural group. Go and make disciples. Now, you can't make disciples until you first evangelize them and share the gospel. That's the starting point to being a disciple is trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and committing oneself to him. And so when it says to go and make disciples, it starts with evangelism. And then it says, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, not only when somebody gets baptized, do they get baptized in the water, but they actually get baptized into a family, a family of faith. They get baptized into the membership of a church. That is fellowship. And then it goes on to say, And teach them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And that, my friend, is discipleship. Now, not only did Jesus speak of these five essentials, but look at what the early church did. They were a healthy church. They were a balanced church. How do I know? Turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It talks about the activities of the early church. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's discipleship. And fellowship. That speaks for itself. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. That's worship. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles, That brought great glory to God. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. That's ministry. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. That's fellowship. Praising God, that's worship. And having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That is evangelism. So Jesus said it and the early church did it. And so I'm confident after 30, now almost 40 years of studying God's Word and the life of Jesus and pastoring people and watching churches, that our goal must be we're going to do all that we can do to be a healthy, balanced church, and and we're going to equally value these five essentials so that we might be a healthy church as well a vibrant church, an alive church, a revitalized church. So what happens when churches get these out of balance? Well, there are churches that I would call 
a soul winning church and, and, and no doubt we need to share the gospel and, and, and win souls and uh, tell the story of God and help people understand th their need for a savior. Uh, trust me, I, I understand the importance of that. But, but sometimes churches, and, and understand, when, when I point out an inconsistency or imbalance in church life, Understand that when I, I point this finger, I'm pointing three right back at me. In my own personal life, I find myself to be way out of balance sometimes. So I, I, I'm not being critical. I'm, I, I'm trying to help us see the value of all five of these essentials of, of, a, of a healthy church. So uh, some churches they get to where they, they focus almost exclusively on having, you know, evangelistic outreach events and, you know, uh, sharing the gospel and training uh, their uh, members how to share the gospel. All of that valuable, all of that important. But, you know, th there'll be an, an evangelistic event. Well, you know, we shared the gospel with 372 people and 49 of them trusted Christ. Great, wonderful. Where are they? How come the back door of the church is wider than the front door how come none of them stay how come none of them grow how come and and so there's a big emphasis on evangelism and seemingly a neglect in some of the other areas that are so essential and then there's the experiencing god church oh this church is is a worship church I mean, you know, when, when, when they come to church and leave, I mean, they've had church. You know, it's, it, it's, it's sometimes a very emotional experience. You know, sometimes, you know, if they got a quiver in their liver, they feel like that they experience God. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's all about coming together and, and, and having a, a worship experience to remember. Well... Should we in any way devalue the, the presence of God and experiencing Him when we're together? I think you understand not. But I've seen churches come together and have a great worship experience and leave and go home and they don't really even know each other. They're not doing life together. They're doing worship together, but they're not doing life together. There's no genuine fellowship, and there's hardly anybody that ever gets saved. So it's not just about experiencing God. I've seen some churches that I would call a family reunion church. Every Sunday, they all get together. They're all friends. They all come together. They talk about their week. They talk about what's going on. Doing life together, pulling for each other, taking care of each other, praying for each other. And every week is like a, a family reunion. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I find that quite often family reunion churches are churches that average in attendance 200 or less. Well, is fellowship important? Of course it's important. Knowing each other feeling wanted, super important. But if it's just a family reunion and we're not discipling people and growing people, then we're out of balance. And then, of course, there's the classroom church, you know, where the pastor stands and teaches and maybe everybody has a notebook and they're filling in the blanks and, you know, they're learning more and more and more. Teach me more. Let me soak in more. You know, uh, teach me the Bible on Sunday morning and again on Sunday night and again on Wednesday night and I might come to the church on Thursday night and, and teach me more, teach me more, teach me more. And so it's all about teaching. But the other essentials are often disregarded. And then, of course, finally, there's the social conscience church. You know, uh, it's all about ministry. It's all about meeting needs. It's all about the disadvantaged. 
Now, now, now there's a liberal version of the social conscious church and there's a conservative version. The, the more liberal version, they have a tendency to, uh, to, to want to, you know, take care of the poor, uh, uh, take care of the disadvantaged, take care of the downtrodden, uh, take care of the immigrants. All, all of that very important. Just don't misunderstand me. I didn't say that wasn't important. Uh, the more conservative version would take on moral issues. You know, the, the protection of the unborn, social conscience, ministry, needs. All important, but perhaps out of balance. And so I've gone through all of this this morning, church, to let you know, thus saith the Lord, the one and the only one who can give his people life. And when they're dead, he can breathe new life into them. When they're divided, he can bring them together. That's the one who taught us and demonstrated it in the early days of the church that in order to be a healthy church, there's some things we've got to do, some things we've got to emphasize, some things we've got to do well, and some things we've got to do in balance. And so I just ask you today to commit in your heart that over these next few weeks, God, I want you to speak to me as we look in the mirror of God's word, as we look at the church, healthy and unhealthy, dead and alive, divided and unified, as we look at the church, I just challenge you. Ask the Lord to show you where it is that you might need more balance that leads to greater health. Thank you for watching Standing on the Word. We invite you to be with us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. The South Seminole Baptist Church is located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in East Ridge, Tennessee. We invite you to join us and together we will share in Standing on the Word.